Good evening, my name is Anthony Oscar Kilo 8 Zulu Tango. Tonight's topic will be successful operating tools for assessing the performance of your station. This is my contact information on my website, kzt.com. And tonight's presentation is available at tiny.cc slash success dash op. And you'll need that to be able to get to some of the links or you'll have to download the uh, PDF version of this from the uh, Rat Pack site. I want to tell, talk a little bit about why this presentation was actually created in the first place. I do a Tuesday evening group with the uh, Long Island CW Club. And one of the people said, well, I've been learning CW and I've been out operating POTA. And I go out and get set up and no one's answering me. I'm not sure what's going on. So I thought about it for a while and thought, well, what information can I give that person to check to make sure it's not something with their station or something going on that's causing people not to answer them. So the first question people are going to ask is, can you hear me? Is my radio working? Am I getting out? So let's talk about some ways you can assess your station's effectiveness and whether you're getting out and whether your signal sounds good. There's going to be a couple different components to successful operating, some of which you have control of, some of which you do not. The first is your station that includes the rig, the feed line, the antenna, etc. So when you're testing your station, you need to be aware of testing all the different parts. The second one is your technique, and we'll talk about some of those things a little bit later, but uh, that has a lot to do with your ability to make contacts. The third one is one you have very little control over, and that's propagation. You can choose when you want to operate based on what the propagation is, but you can't change the propagation based on when you want to operate. So current band conditions are going to be current band conditions, and they can change in a moment, so they may, may not be the same. Then the fourth thing you have very little control over is the receiving station. That's the station on the other end. Uh, you don't have a lot of control over them. So when it comes down to checking, we can check our station and our technique. So the first thing we're going to talk about is things that your station that you can use to check to make sure everything's working okay. And to just, this doesn't have to necessarily mean there's a problem. These are things you would check all the time to make sure things continue to be working okay. Uh, I like having a power uh, meter, uh, an S slash SWR meter, whether it's the same meter or not. But I like to see the fact that some visual indication that when I'm transmitting, I'm actually seeing power going out. And that's also a good indication that's going into the right antenna by having one SWR meter for each of the various antennas. I can take a glance up real quick and tell, hey, I see that meter moving up and down. Obviously, the power is going in the right direction. I'm putting out some power. Uh, occasionally, I'll use my radio with the side tone only to practice uh, some sending or something like that, and I'll turn the power down to zero. And if I forget to do that, I could sit there and call CQ for the rest of the day and never have anyone answer me and not realize things are going wrong. But if I glanced at my power meter, I'd realize in a second that no power was going out. A field strength meter is sort of a very blunt instrument for measuring things. It lets you basically detect whether there's RF, strong RF in the atmosphere around the meter. So it's not a precision instrument, but it's something you can get relative readings with. Um, it's not something that hams use a lot as much as they used to, but it's just a basically a really simple receiver in a way with a meter attached to it to show you there's signal. It's totally independent of everything else because it's not attached to anything. You're actually receiving it over the air. Uh, antenna analyzers uh, and monitor scopes, I'm not going to dig too deep into those type of uh, test things today. I'll leave that for another whole session, but just tell you that they are there. Um, it, you, you, also, using your station's monitor function on your rig might be as simple as being able to get feedback and hear uh, your signal. And most of us do that on CW. We have a side tone turned on, so we're actually hearing uh, the fact that we are sending, so we can hear what we're sending. I do have some links here on using power in SWR meters, on choosing one, how to use them, uh, how do you use the cross needle ones if that's your choice. That's not been my big thing. I've always went with single needles, but some people really like those. Basics of using SWR meters and antenna analyzers and some other information. So these are all links. Some of them are videos. Some of them are, are uh, text you'll have to read. But again, whenever you come to one of my sessions, I'm going to guarantee that you have homework to do after work. 
Here's a video that you can watch on your own. I'm not going to play the video for you today. It's a video from W2AEW, and he talks about building a small interface so he can interface his radio to his uh, oscilloscope and monitor his signal that way. And there's the little interface he has, but we're going to let you read the rest of it. Watch the rest of it later. Uh, antenna analyzers, there's a variety of them out there. Um, they don't all necessarily perform the same function, but what most of them let you do is uh, detect things like resonant frequencies, SWR, uh, things of that nature. A lot of people are going with nano VNAs. It's a very inexpensive device. Uh, they're available for $49, some of them the, the up to maybe 100 for a very good one. And uh, they can do a lot of measurements, but there's a little bit of learning curve involved with those. MFJ makes the uh, uh, MFJ antenna analyzers. There's about five of them in this series. Uh, from the very simple ones that cover just HF to ones that go all the way up into VHF and UHF. Uh, these basically give you a couple different readings. They give you an SWR, they give you a, a resistance, and they will give you a frequency readout. Uh, Rigger Expert has some nice little handheld units. Uh, there's a variety of models. Uh, these are five different uh, resources on using antenna analyzers. One from Ask Dave, a KE0OG. Uh, it's his episode number one, antenna analyzers. There's also nano VNO, VNAs made easy. Uh, another one on nano VNAs, uh, one on using MFJ antenna analyzers, and one on using the Rig Expert AA55. So these are all give you an idea of how to do all these things and use these, uh, which I don't have time to do this evening. The next thing we're going to talk about is not using test equipment, but using other hams. Basically, this is the, if someone's hearing me, they can tell me how my signal sounds. And a good thing to do is have a nearby ham friend that can listen for you. That eliminates the whole propagation issue and worrying about that. So if you have someone that's just a, a short distance from you, you'll be able to make contacts very easily. You won't worry about propagation, fading, uh, anything like that. It's just much easier when you have someone close by. Now, if you don't have someone lined up as a friend to do that, then you need to go out and find out who's on the air ready to listen to you. So who's waiting to listen to you? Well, you might be able to check into a local net or even a distance net and get an idea of your signal that way. There's a lot of nets scheduled at various times, and I have a whole list of nets in another presentation I'm going to be doing later on. Um, there's also a contest where you can get on the air and make contacts and I find that a good time to try things out because there's a lot of people on so I know someone's going to respond to me if I'm getting a signal out but the problem is you're not going to get any valid signal reports everyone will say you're 599 and I suggest you say the same thing back to them uh, or 59 on phone uh, CQing may work but unfortunately maybe no one's just interested in making a contact with you they, you know they've already worked a bunch of k8s today and they're not interested in operating working another one so they might ignore me so my signal might be great and i might be getting out great but the fact that no one's answering my cq doesn't tell me whether that's the case or not it's not very helpful and if you have friends on a mailing list or text group or such that you can get in contact with and set up a schedule of time that might be a great way to do it um, and have a known quantity. Once you do find someone that's willing to listen to you on the air uh, and make contact with you, if you're operating a single sideband, I suggest you use that opportunity to adjust your mic for your voice and your specific microphone. I'm sorry, adjust your radio mic controls for your voice and your specific mic. Things like mic gain, compression, some radios have other audio uh, settings for transmissions. They have auto equalizers actually where you can change the high and low uh, tones and the volume that's being provided uh, so you can get the best possible signal. And if you change microphones, you may need to go through this whole process again. Be careful about using too much compression. It can cause distortion. Uh, also, I have a whole presentation here on reducing splatter from on-air on, on blogs. And by the way, as I, I forgot to mention, but all these things in the serif uh, italicized font means they're links that you can click on to go out and get that information. I didn't make that real clear before. So all these are links. Uh, here's another link on clean, punchy, competitive audio without splatter. And another one that is sort of funny from Steve Katz called it, you're not your microphone, it's you. And that's a very good one on adjusting your settings to match your voice and uh, the, the uniqueness about your voice. Other on-air assistance of the hams, if you're a CW operator, 
make sure your CW note is clean with no clicks. If your rig has a rise time setting for CW, make sure it is set no faster than five milliseconds. Actually, I'd even suggest about half that would be just fine. I'm sorry, twice that speed would be half that speed would be just fine. So uh, having it at 12 milliseconds is fine. But if you set it for lower times, you'll introduce key clicks. So you don't want a very fast switchover. So six milliseconds should be the limit. Check to make sure you're not dropping elements. Uh, so for example, let's say you're dropping the first dit of uh, every character you send or the first character in your transmission. It might be a couple different things. It could be a poor keyer. It could be excessive switch over time from your received to transmit on your radio. This is much more common when you're using amplifiers and you might have to uh, have enough time for it to switch over. So those are all things you want to check to make sure that you're really putting out on the air what you think you're sending out. Uh, make sure the code that you think you're sending is really what you're sending. I know people that have poor, a, a bad keyer problem and they don't realize it that it's sending out a character wrong. So, you know, it's great to have someone listen to you and make sure that you, they're, hear, they're hearing exactly what you think you're sending. We'll talk about a way that you can actually do, be the receiver of yourself in a few minutes here. So a couple other things you can do without another person, I call these self-serve items. They're both on air and online. They're self-serve and that you don't have to make arrangements with another ham. So there's basically six different things here. We're gonna talk about each one individually, but let me just go through them briefly. Beacons are uh, something you can receive with your radio. They're used for evaluating receive only on your radio because they can't hear you, you hear them. But it's a great way to see whether your antenna is working, whether your receiver is working, and whether the area you think should be open propagation-wise is really open. The reverse beacon network, as the very term reverse means, it's not something you listen for, it's something that listens for you. So in this case, it can listen for you just as a friend might listen for you. And the reverse beacon network, though, is limited to CW and RIDI. It can't decode your voice. It can only decode CW or RIDI. So uh, the reverse beacon network won't find you if you're calling CQ on phone, but it can find you if you're calling on CW. FT8 and FT4, uh, you can easily check your progress on those with PSK Reporter. And PSK Reporter is very easy to use and you can just see all the stations that heard you in a specific time. That doesn't mean they made a contact with you, that means they heard you. So in the last 24 hours, these are the stations that are around the world that heard me transmitting this morning on FT8. And you'll see that uh, six hours ago, I was minus 18 dB in Hawaii, and uh, I was on, um, what band was I on here? On uh, 12 meters, I was minus 19 in uh, to, uh, Venezuela. So PSK Reporter can be a great tool, and we'll go through more of that in a moment here. Uh, the WhisperNet, we'll talk more about that. Spotting networks, basically DS, DX clusters, if you see your information going up. This is the only place you'll see spotting of single sideband. Online tunable SDRs. Uh, these are software-defined radios that you can tune with your uh, computer and listen to faraway uh, receivers, and we'll go into great detail on that. Let's talk about the beacons first. The most common beacons uh, on the HF bands are the NCDXF slash AIRU International Beacon Project. It has rotating transmissions from 18 stations around the world. They transmit on 20 meters, 17 meters, 15 meters, 12 meters, and 10 meters. Um, these uh, are being replaced by a lot of people. They don't use them as much as they did before because we have the reverse beacon network and other things, but they are still very useful. Um, and the nice thing is they're always there. You don't have to worry about them not being there. If they aren't there, it will tell you it's not there and you go to the website and it'll show you which beacons are active and which ones you should be listening for. They send in CW. If you're not really proficient at CW, that's not a problem because you'll know when you should be listening for the sound of one of them and you'll know which one it is if you go to the website. So by using the website in conjunction with listening on your radio, you really do not need to know CW. You just have to listen for a sound at that time. So when you go out to the beacon network, it looks like this. And these are the beacons around the world. And there's some tools for listenings here. You can go to the transmission schedule. So it tells me right now, on 20 meters, the beacon that's transmitting is LU4AA. Now it just switched over, now it's OA4B. So if I was tuned to 14100, 
right now, and I'm hearing CW, that is Peru. Okay? And you can try that if you want. If you want to turn your radio on, uh, you can do that later. You can do it now if you want. But you could f- go tune to any of these frequencies and listen for any of these beacons. And notice they keep rotating through. So as one st- finishes up on 20, it then starts on 17. The one that was on 17 then moves to 12 and so forth. And they keep cycling every 10 seconds. And you can listen for the sound of those on your radio um, at that given frequency. The reverse beacon network, as I mentioned earlier, is not something you listen for, it listens for you. So it's a network of stations listening to the bands and reporting the stations they hear and how well they hear them. In other words, it gives you a DB report, so it tells you how strong your signal is. Also, it tells you how fast you're sending in CW. It'll give you a CW sending speed uh, when you listen to it. And there's a very interesting article here from the National Contest Journal, September 2012, talking about the history of the Reverse Beacon Network. Again, you can click on that link and read through all of it uh, at your leisure. Now, this is this link here uh, gets you the Reverse Beacon Network. The Reverse Beacon Network is reversebeacon.net. And once you get there, there's a number of different little menus. The one you're going to want to probably use in most cases is the DX Spots menu. And you can go in there and you can use that to look at either a specific frequency or all the different HF bands. Let me try that again. I moved my mouse too quick. There we go. So right now it's showing me the stations that are being heard. It here's uh, K1HE. Let me zoom in on this a little bit. This is not going to zoom in. That's what I thought. Let's try one more different way here. There we go. Okay, so we have a map, but let's go down here at these settings. So KM3T heard KE1HE. The distance between the two stations was 704 miles. They were on 30 meters. He was sending CW. It was 14 dB, and that already sunk off the screen here. Now we're seeing another one. We're seeing uh, that a, J, a JA station here to 3 Delta and gives the information here. So it tells you the strength of the signal, the speed, and the time, and how long ago it was. Now, it's very important to realize that the spotter is just as important as the station being spotted because I probably, if I would tune to... Uh, 12 meters right now would probably not hear the three delta because he's being heard by a station in Japan, not a station in the United States. Now, right now, this station in Costa Rica is here in this station in Ohio. So there's a very good chance that the opposite would occur. If I got on and transmitted, T17W would probably hear me in Costa Rica and I would be able to see my report back on that. So that's the, the spots that are there. The other thing you can do with the reverse beacon network, and I'm going to go back to the slides because they're a little easier to read. Let me just talk a few minutes about some of the other aspects of it. It's At each of these receiving locations, there's banks of SDR, software-defined radio receivers, and they're using a software called CW Skimmer. It's a piece of software that you can buy and run on your local computer, but in this case, they're running it on these uh, multiple uh, different frequencies. And it's a multi-stream CW decoding software. In other words, it decodes a whole chunk of the band, not just one frequency. And it'll try and decode the stations. There's then aggregating software that takes the information from all the worldwide skimmers and sends it to the reverse beacon network site. From there, you can see the display as we saw earlier from the reverse beacon network site. There's really two main things you're going to want to do as far as assessing your own station. If you go to DX Spots and then go to Spot Search, you can search for information on your call sign and who's hearing you. So the first type is DX Station. That'd be the the two little checkboxes here. When you have DX Station checked, that's the station that is being spotted. So that would mean that's my station being spotted by other stations. If you choose DE, that would mean it's my spots from my stations of other stations that are transmitting. So in most cases, you're going to want to have the DX button checked uh, to hear where your signal is going. So what I did is I got on the air and transmitted a simple CQ. uh, And you'll notice that here, when I had it on the DX option, all these stations heard me. And they reported back my signals. And I did it a couple different times. So on 15 meters, I was 20 dB. Uh, sending it 29 words per minute, copied by the station in Costa Rica. 
I transmitted on uh, 20 meters and I was heard by KO7SS out west and I was 12 dBs there. Uh, I transmitted on, 16 me on 160 meters and Jim, who's about 30 miles northeast of me here in Jaga County heard me and I was 27 dB there. So these are all the stations that heard me. If I turn on the DE option, I need to plug in a station that's a monitoring station. Now, I'm not a monitoring station, but I know K3LR, who's about 50 miles east of me, is. So I put him in as the DE. These are all the stations that K3LR is listening, hearing. So if I wanted to use this for working DX, I would use the DE option to hear what stations are being spotted. If I'm using it to evaluate my signal, I'd use the DX option and put my call sign in. Well, how do you get the reverse beacon network to hear your call? Your call. Well, the first thing is you want to call CQ, and there's a couple. CQ itself it will be recognized, and it will log you. In addition to CQ, it'll also recognize the word test or QRZ. Recently, they've also added FD for field day, SS for sweepstakes, NA for North American QSO party, and UP. Now, why would they possibly do up? Who sends up? DX stations. So this catches DX stations that aren't calling CQ. A lot of times DX stations will get going so fast they won't bother calling CQ. They'll just send a, a thank you every once in a while, but they'll also say up because they're working split. So these are all recognized. All seven of these things will be recognized. So if I sent my call sign with any, along with any of these seven uh, text m messages here, it would be recognized. So I called CQ. I could have called test if I wanted to. And a lot of people, test is actually for contest, but you can also use test when you just want to test uh, so people won't answer your CQ. Because if you're calling CQ for the reverse beacon network to hear you, someone else might hear you and respond. So you could call, send CQ. You, uh, you can send test. You could send CQ test together if you wanted to. Uh, make sure you leave a space. You should try and send everything at the same consistent speed. If you don't have a real consistent fist, I would suggest using a keyer and a memory keyer so you can simply hit it and send your call out that way so it'll be perfectly spaced. So using your rig CW memory to send your call was a great way to do it or using machine generated code. So I ran a couple tests here. Test A was five watts of power, that's what I usually run, to a three element Yagi at 50 foot and my beam was pointed at 270 degrees west. I transmitted on 20 meters, and these are all the stations that heard me. Notice these, they all heard me at the same time. So 1940, 1914 was the time. It was back on September of, I'm sorry, February 27th. And notice the different dBs, the signal strength. WA7LNW heard me at 9 dB. Uh, ZF1A heard me at 12 dB. Uh, K6OD heard me at 60B, Costa Rica I was 13, and so forth and so forth. So all these stations heard me, and notice my speed was consistent somewhat. Some of them thought it was 19, some thought it was 18. I was probably right in between the two. I then did test B. Test B, I ran 5 watts again, but I used my 43-foot vertical. Here's the results of test B. Uh, there were less stations that heard me. There were still quite a few, though. Not all the same stations heard me. And th there was different reports. And I'll talk about that in a minute. But this was the information when I used the reverse beacon network with my vertical. Here's the comparison of the stations that heard me on both. Or some of them heard me on both. Some only heard me on one. So ZF1A heard me at 12 dB on the beam, which has a lot more gain on, on uh, 20 meters than my vertical does. Uh, so I was a little bit down there. TI7W heard me much louder on the vertical. Well, part of the reason was I was pointed away from him on the beam. Uh, K3PA on the beam, I was really hitting him loud. On the vertical, I wasn't doing that much. So you can compare antennas this way also. So I also went through and decided, let me see what what I can do. So I used uh, two different antennas for these different tests. Uh, the, everything above 30 meters was on the beam. Everything below that was on my vertical or my dipole. I guess I used three antennas for this. And I checked. This is all within, let's see, 1932 to 1926. So six minutes. 
I transmitted on all the HF bands, including the work bands. I did not copy transmit on 60 or 30 at the time. But you'll notice that everything from 160 to 10 meters was open somewhere in the world. And I was copied on the reverse beacon network with the lowest reading being uh, 3, 3 dB. So there was very likely I could have made a contact with any band, at least somewhere in the world at that time. This again was in March at 1930 Zulu. So all the HF bands were working and my radio was working. Uh, the reverse beacon network can also be used to compare your signal with other stations. You can go to the DX spot and choose the spot analysis tool and you can choose uh, to look at how your signal compares with other stations. So I picked three, sta two, uh, three stations I knew were working during the same period of time I was. This is during the 160 contest. Uh, the, I think this is the, the CQ 160 contest. Um, K3LR, N1UR, and K1LT, all three contest stations. So they all have a lot better signal than I do. But you can see the spots here in comparison with these three different stations uh, over time. Uh, looking at how well they were heard in various places. You can also use some other tools with the reverse, reverse beacon network. Uh, if you use the, uh, the HAM Atlas, you can use it to visually show the spots on HAM Atlas. So combining the reverse beacon network with something like HAM Atlas allows you to visualize where the spots are at. And there's a video here on the, showing you how this works and you can Go through that video when you like and it'll show you how to set it up and how to use the various features when you're doing those two but you do have the, the dx atlas software also here's some uh, information on using the reverse beacon network uh, there's a link here on just using it and that's from the reverse beacon network itself in their help page there's one from Tim Duffy, K3LR, using CW Skimmer in the Reverse Beacon Network. And he talks about it more on a localized basis at his contest station, K3LR, where they have a whole wall full of, of uh, SDRs with separate antennas for each one and a the CW Skimmer software and a separate computer for each one. So they're analyzing all the spots that come in. And they go to their station, but then they also push them out onto the Reverse Beacon Network. Now, they could choose if they wanted to not to send them out to the reverse beacon network, just do the skimming locally and just use that information for their contesting station, but they push it out to everyone. Dave Kassler, KE0OG, has two articles, uh, two YouTubes, one on the ham radio reverse beacon network, and then another one he talks about using your radio's CW memory. So even if you're not a CW operator, it tells you how you can send out CW signals so the reverse beacon network will be able to tell how well you're getting out. And he talks specifically about using an ICOM 7300, but it's applicable to many other radios also. Uh, KM6JUR has a quick walk through the reverse beacon network with tips, CW tips for beginner. And N6TV has CW and Ritty skimmers and the reverse beacon network. It's an article from the contest uh, university 2017. Uh, so all these are available for you to take a look at. Most of these are videos, some are text. Uh, there's also an article here and information from qrp.com. You can use the reverse beacon network for automatic POTA and SOTA spotting. And he has information there. In order to do sp POTA and SOTA spotting, you need to know when to look for your information on the reverse be beacon network and where you'll be operating. In addition, you add, need to add your schedule information at the POTA site or create alert on the SOTA site. So you set up both of these ahead of time before you go out in the field, and then the reverse beacon network will hear you. And based on this information it gets, it'll let people know that not only did it hear your signal, but it'll automatically spot the fact that you're a POTA or SOTA station. The reverse beacon network can also be used to find members of specific clubs, mainly CW clubs, of course, because that's what it copies. So there's a whole list of CW clubs at the top. You can check or uncheck the ones you want to see. And anytime a member of any of these groups shows up in the reverse beacon network, it'll show you that spot so you can work them very easily. So if you're into SKCC or you're into FIST or CW Ops or FOC, any of those, you can easily set this up so that you'll see spots. You can also choose to not do the clubs, but in fact do different uh, geographic locations or different bands. 
Uh, so, and you can also even choose different speeds. So you only see spots when they're in a certain speed range. So if you're looking for C slow CW, you can find it that way. I mentioned PSK Reporter a little earlier. I showed you the shot. Here's another screenshot from it. Uh, the reports on the stations decoding around the world. Now, the interesting thing is, even if you don't use FT8, you can use it as a propagation tool. All you need to know is another station that uses it and use them as your tool. So when I went to that site a little earlier, let's say I didn't ever use PSK Reporter, but I know that my friend WA3JAT uses it. I can actually use him because he's right down the street from me to see where his signals are going in the last 24 hours. And that'll give me a good indication of what bands are open to where. It won't tell me anything about my station's performance, but it'll tell me that hey, Hawaii was available four hours ago, at minus 20 dB for Jim. It's probably about the same for me. And even more important, I look down here in the South Pacific and I see that uh, it looks like uh, VK4 and some ZLs and even a station here in uh, uh, Indonesia was available. So you can use it that way. And I wrote an article for our local newsletter on using, and that's what this link is right here, it's called using PSK Reporter site as a website propagation tool. And it talks about how all the settings on PSK Reporter work. So if you're using it yourself or you're using it with another person, it tells you how to set it up to be able to check the propagation. You can even use this for the DX station you want to work. Put their call sign in and see who they're hearing. I mean, sorry, who's hearing them. So this information is all available whether you use P uh, FT8 or not. You can still use the PSK Reporter software for your benefit. WhisperNet is a protocol designed specifically for probing potential propagation paths. It sends very low power transmissions, and it's basically a one-way transmission. Someone's receiving it on the other end, and it'll give you information, uh, including the call sign, the main head grid locator, and the transmitted power in dBs. And I'm not going to go through the stuff on WhisperNet. I have a link here for more information on it. I'll let you go through that. This is just a couple screenshots of it. Program can decode signals with signal noise ratio as low as minus 28 dB uh, in a 25 hertz ba bandwidth. So you can get a lot of stations in there and it can be very weak and it'll give you this information. Stations with internet access can automatically upload reception reports to a central database and then everyone has access to them. So that's it for that. Now let's talk about the last one I had in the list, and that's online tunable SDRs, software-definable radios. And this is my grandson, Holden. He's using one of the software-defined radios, and he's not using a radio to do it with. He's using it on his phone. So this is a great way to listen to HF, even if you don't have a radio. But it's also a great way to listen to your own transmissions on your radio from your station from multiple locations around the world to see how you sound. So you can actually listen to your own signals coming back to you from any point in the world, basically by finding a station that can receive you from that location. Uh, I use this a lot when I'm working with uh, school students. I do a lot of programs for schools, and we do a one-day program called Radio Day where I work on a bunch of different projects. We teach a bunch of lessons using uh, radio is the basis, things like uh, inverse proportional fractions using frequency and wavelength. So while I'm doing all those activities, I need some activities for the part, the portions of the group I'm not working with right now. And the software-defined radios work out great because most of them have Chromebooks or other computers available in the classroom. So I put together this uh, presentation. It's very short. It's just a little four-page. I think it's four-page. And I can give this to the kids, and it's designed so that someone who's never really used radio that much can understand how to use this. But for you, it would all be very easy. You can use this. There's really two choices, the Web SDR collection and the Kiwi collection. These are both a large number of collected sites around the world that have radios that you can use for free that you can tune in. Um, I have a brief description showing how to basically set things up for a, a Web SDR, uh, what kind of controls you can use. And then I also have information like, you know, what type of frequency band, what modes to use. Uh, so if you're doing 20 meters, you want to be on upper side band. I have a list of frequencies here. Let me zoom in on this a little bit. Zoomed in a little bit too far. I have frequencies on this list too. So it's basically set up to give them some idea of what they need to set up, how to set the filtering, how to zoom in on the display. Also have something very similar for the Kiwi system with a set of instructions here for using the Kiwi. They have a little bit different controls on them. I also then have some other things that are not 
the same. These are other uh, tuners around the world that you can use. So there's some other ones besides. The SDR Sharp Airspace, Air Spies require that you install software on your local computer for most of them. Almost all the other ones use a web browser, so there's nothing to be installed. But for these Air Spies, you need to usually install the software ahead of time. So I don't use that with the kids that often. Now, this is very interesting. This has nothing to do with amateur radio, but it has something to do with radio. And the kids like this. It's just a great way to go on and listen to commercial stations anywhere in the world. So I'll give you this link, radio.garden. Uh, that lets you go out and listen. So if you're a sports fan, you can listen to your favorite local baseball team from that location. So if you're out, out of the area, let's say you were originally a, uh, I don't know, a Pittsburgh Pirates fan and you've moved out to California, you can listen to the Pittsburgh Pirates on KDKA by going to World Garden Radio. It's just a list, and it's a globe you spin around and you can see stations around the world on Radio Garden. It's fun. It has nothing to do with tonight's presentation, but it's in here anyway, so I thought I'd mention it. I then have some other information in here about about radios. I also have some DX spots so they can get some ideas of spots that are out there to try and find stations that are seeing as spotted, and that works out very well. I also have some information here on which bands are available, what modes, uh, what time it's best to use them, and the frequencies. So that's available in this presentation here. It's got tiny.cc slash free rx. I also have a whole slide share on using software to find radios, including what I'm going to describe for tonight, but a bunch of other things also. And then there's also a video recording for a group I did. I think it was Queen City Club in Cincinnati. I did that recording for um, for their club. So again, tiny.cc slash OSDR is the presentation. Let's take a look at one of these uh, well, let's, let me finish this up, and then we'll take a look at one of them. So what can you do with them? Well, you could test multiple antennas by choosing uh, one station and listening to all your different antennas. So instead of having someone on the other end, you can be the person listening to a station that's far away or close, depending on where you want it. And you can listen as you transmit and see what you sound like. You can map as antenna azimuth patterns by choosing different stations around the world and seeing how strong you are at each of them. Uh, you can find maximal use of frequency by choosing different locations. You can see whether the band is open to a specific location on a specific band. You can also compare radios, microphones, radio settings, all of these by listening to your own signal coming back from a re remote station that you can tune yourself. By using SDRs, you can also monitor stations answering the DX station. So if let's say you're a DXer and so, uh, there's a rare DX station you want to work and he's working split. Well, either you're transmitting and you're hearing, um, you're not hearing anything, or you're listening for the DX station, or you stop transmitting and you tune around to see the other stations he's trying to listen to. Wouldn't it be great if while you're transmitting, you could still listen to see what the other stations sound like? Well, what you can do is find an SDR that's close to you and listen on that to the other stations while you're using your own radio to try and contact the DX station. Or... It's even better for the high bands. Not the high bands are open. I forgot about a fact of DXing that was not as cut, not as much a problem. When 20 was open, a lot of times when you're working a DX station, you can hear all the other stations that are working them. But when you're trying to work a DX station on 10 or 12 meters, quite often you can't hear all the stations that are trying to work the DX station because they're too close to you. But what you can do is find a station that's close to the, where the DX station's at in the general area, it doesn't have to be the same exact country. Listen on that software to find radio to the portion of the band he's listening to. And all of a sudden, all those stations that are too close to you for you to hear, you can hear them on the software to find radio. So it can be a great tool to help you work that rare one on DX that's working split. Um, I'll come back to the SDRs, but uh, just the, well, this is also on the SDRs. I use a piece of software called w, W3SUN. It's basically a DX cluster aggregator, and it lets me do different filtering and different things on it. And I'm running it actually here in the other corner of my screen right now. But one of the things they've added is when you right-click on a station, you can choose to listen to it on one of the Kiwis. So if you don't want to change your radio to listen to it, you can choose one of the Kiwis and see if you can hear the station or hear, choose a station further away from you and see if you can hear it there. Uh, the Kiwi radios are a little bit different. Uh, basically, that you sort for you search for them based on locations. So let's take a look first at some of the S Web SDRs at Web SDR. 
So I clicked on this. I went to the presentation. I clicked on this link right here. This little web SDR. So I'm at www.websdr.org. And when you do that, you're going to see a list. And it's about 75 or 80 stations around the world. You can pick which one you want. Some of them have multiple bands. Some have single bands. Some have uh, VHF and UHF. So like this one in Nuremberg, uh, it starts at at uh, 10 meters and goes all the way up to 440. So you could listen to German, VHF, and UHF. Actually, it's not in Germany. It's in, it's in Switzerland. I'm sorry. Uh, some of them have medium frequencies. And they, this, this particular one has medium and high frequencies. Uh, some have HF. This particular one only has 2.3 2 to 3, 3379. I'm not sure exactly what that is, but um, it's not an amateur band. This one again here has uh, coverage on 40 meters only. So you can pick any one you want. Let's pick one here. Let's... Uh, well, I always end up going back to the first. The first one is not there anymore. They moved a different one there. Well, we'll use the one in Utah here. This has a. This one you have to choose which of the three you want, uh, based on the bands you want to listen to. So let's choose the one that has 40 meters, and uh, we'll go to this. And I'm going to up my volume so you can hear this. And I'm also going to go back and change my sharing. I forgot to do the little checkbox. So if we double click on any of these spots here. anywhere we want well, this, we're gonna hear this is gonna be FT8 for sure We could also go down to the CW end of the band, which I'm not, we would want to change this filtering and everything. So we change our mode, we change our filtering, and we could do all that and listen to CW. So let's go to the 20 meter CW band, see if we hear anything there. Guess what, we're parked right on the FT8 frequency. filter it I filtered it a little bit too much and got him out of the band pass there So hopefully you get the general idea. We could do that with any of the different stations. We could be listening for ourselves and hear what we sound like. Now, one of the other things you can do is with the digital modes and with the CW, you can use a virtual audio cable to connect that to uh, the WSJTX software. If you want to decode uh, FT8 or FT4, you could actually do that from that tool. If you want to decode CW with something like CW Skimmer, you could run that through a virtual audio cable also. So those are all available. I talk more about that in the presentation that is available that just goes into the uh, software defined radios. Again, that's this presentation right here. Come on, move. I lost my mouse froze.
Can someone tell me if you're still hearing me? I, I had a little internet glitch there for just a second. Okay, good. I had that same thing happen last night. Okay, so when you go into this presentation here on uh, Software Defined Radios, there's more information on using virtual cables. We'll skip over some of these slides. It tells you how to listen to the bands. There's some videos here on using it. There's also a way to use it for direction finding. Here's more information on SDRs in general, but there's also a thing here where I'm talking about using the uh, virtual, uh, virtual, there it is, uh, VB audio software, which lets you do a virtual cable between the SDR software which you're listening to on your browser and whatever programs you want to run the audio through to decode it, whether it's uh, FT8 or FT4 using uh, WSJTX or whether it's decoding with CW Skimmer or other tools. And these are some information on doing that. Okay, so the other thing I had in this presentation, the last thing, well, not the last thing, but what happens if you've tried all these tools and you're not hearing yourself. I'm, I'm sorry, you're hearing yourself just fine. Everything sounds good. You've tested everything. Everything sounds good. Well, then you need to worry that it's one of these things. It could either be operating technique. Maybe you're doing something wrong. It could be something as simple as having your radio set on split. So you're actually transmitting on a different frequency than you think you are. And that's why no one's hearing you. It could be an equipment issue. Uh, it could be a bad microphone, for example, on phone. Uh, it could be software issues. If your FT8 and FT4 aren't working, I have a good suggestion that's probably your time is off, but it could be other software issues also. It also could be band conditions. It could be other things like you have no friends or no one wants to talk to you or you have a really bad call sign that no one likes, in which case you need to go to the, uh, the presentation we did a couple months ago on choosing your ideal call sign uh, for an idea on a new call sign. Um, I have a whole presentation here on some techniques. So if it's a technique problem and not a radio problem, this will help you get started. And this presentation is uh, called uh, How to Make the QSO Get in the Rhyme, Know the Rhythm, Know the Rhythm, I'm sorry, Get the Rhythm, Know the Rhyme, and Dance the Dance. And basically what it comes down to is the rhythm is the timing uh, that you choose to answer other people and your frequency choice, including zero beating other stations. Knowing the rhyme involves uh, knowing the contest or signal report exchange so that you can give with the other person. And dance the dance is being able to mimic the other stations and how they operate. And there's a whole bunch of information on here. Uh, for example, trying to squeeze into a, into a CQ is sort of like merging onto a highway. So I talk a lot about techniques for doing that in this presentation. Again, that's available at uh, tiny.cc slash r dash I'm sorry slash r dash r dash d uh, the rest of this presentation talks a little bit about what you can do as far as once you know everything's working how do you plan for portable operations or how do you plan for operations in general and one of the things is by choosing the proper band for the time of day that you want to operate and the time of year and the point in the solar cycle so I have a whole lot of information here on propagation resources, uh, information on propagation resources and spotting, uh, information on how to put out your information, like if you're going to do a polar operation so people will know you're out there, uh, things that you can use in the field for spotting, both receiving spots and sending spots. Here's information on using POTA spotting. Here's VHF and UHF spotting information at DX maps. Uh, grid master heat is used considerably for different grid collectors, especially satellite operators. I have a whole presentation on portable and field operations. Uh, and then I have some tips here on packing and portable operations, and I'm gonna skip over those for tonight's presentation. So that's the end of it. Again, it's a tiny.cc slash success, success dash op. And I'll put that link in the, uh, in the chat And I will go ahead and take questions. It's important, like Anthony said, to be aware of the propagation conditions. For example, today, the sun has had some sunspots really explode. And there were three CMEs being sent earthward. And uh, the band conditions aren't going to be good for the next couple of days. So if you're aware of that, sometimes it might be a reason why you can't transmit. 
Well, people oh, before, aren't hearing you anyway. They're going to be they're going to be able to see the aurora down in Ohio and in, in, in uh, Boise tonight in the next couple of nights because there's going to be so much atmospheric interference. Back to you, Anthony. Yeah, and before I forget, uh, Dennis uh, W6DQ and I are going to be doing a series on getting started on HF. So again, like we did the series on VHF and UHF on Rat Pack a couple weeks ago, we're going to do a series uh, of three presentations on getting started on HF. So if you're not really that familiar with HF, you know, tune in for that. But also, again, if you know anyone that's just starting out, that's a great session to be able to tell them about. We don't have a date scheduled yet, but it'll probably be in early October or sub September or October. Yeah, go ahead, Dennis. There we go. Yeah, I'm working. Okay. Hey, Anthony, uh, great presentation. I have one comment about one thing you said, and it's something to be aware of. If you're using a nearby friend, another ham, to listen to your signal, you've got to be careful that you don't overload his receiver because yes. that will distort your signal. So it's something yeah, not to too close. Yeah, you don't want to right. too close. I got somebody right next door to me. So that <laughs> when he's on the air, I can't work. But, you know, getting somebody that's a reasonable distance away so that you're not overloading their radio or what they can do is reduce the gain on their on their receiver, you know, reduce the RF gain and, and mitigate that. So you just don't want to overload their front end. Yeah. And that, that's a problem that he may think that your signal sounds terrible, but it's really the fact that you're overloading his radio. So. Yeah, too close is definitely when you don't need an antenna to receive them, you're too close. Or the antenna's disconnected. Yes. And I actually listened to a, the, a local station. Uh, he wasn't that close, unfortunately, for him, but he was running a lot of power on the FT8. And basically, I had my radio connected to my antenna switch, but there was nothing attached to the switch. So it was basically three foot jumper, and I was getting him <laughs> at plus 12 dB on FT8. So. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> Just don't transmit when it's like that. <laughs> But yeah, that's something to be cautious of. Just a just a warning for for folks so that they don't do that. Yes, and and also you know what? In addition to that, you won't sound right either. Even that's if right. even if you aren't overloading them, you need to get someone a little bit further away because it needs to right. be actual radio propagation distance, not shouting distance. Yeah, that's true. Mm -hmm. All right, good stuff. Other questions. One other thing occurred to me, Anthony, on the on the web SDRs. If if folks haven't used those a lot, um, we use them all the time. I, I've I've got them programmed into my uh, my uh, bookmarks for different frequencies and different uh, web SDRs. You, you're having trouble tuning it. Zoom in on the display, and it's a whole lot easier to tune a station in if you're zoomed in on the display. Don't leave the display wide like like you had it there. Um, use the zoom controls, or if you've got a mouse wheel, you can use the mouse wheel to zoom in by hovering over the, the spectrum display. Yeah, let me show something on that real quick here while, before I forget. Be great. I forgot to show this one thing on that. I want to show when you're doing that, there's most of the most of the sites have the ability to most of the sites have the ability to uh, let you use your keyboard controls, but sometimes you have to turn it on. So make sure if you're doing that that you turn on the keyboard controls. This particular one, and a lot of them also, you need to hit the start audio before you start it up. So let me go ahead and, you know what, I didn't share the screen with, I did share with Scout Sound. Okay, there we go. So when you start up the audio on this, and you go to the, the, to the display, Dennis said, you definitely want to zoom in on the waterfall. And then, Remember that you can type in the frequency also to get started. So that'll get you started with that part of it. And then make sure you have the box checked that says a lot keyboard. And then you can use your right and left arrows to move back and forth, which can be helpful. Now, I need to choose a different frequency here because this is Europe in the middle of the uh, night. Okay, I'm moving that with my mouse, with my uh, keyboard now. I didn't type in the right thing. Let's try that one more time. Hmm, I'm, that's weird. I'm not seeing anything on there. There's someone.
There we go. Well, the other thing too is if you grab this wrong, you'll actually change the size of the display. That means you're adjusting the filter narrower, so you don't. You want to make sure when you grab it, you're not doing that. I seem to pick the spot right in the middle where there is no one. There's some utility of some sort with a beeping sound. Pick another one here just so we do a couple different ones. Let's pick something in the U.S. So again, we'll zoom in on this waterfall. It'll make it a lot easier to see it. We'll make sure that we have the filter set where we want it, depending on what we want. Make sure you have the mode set where you want. And then you can tune around and allow the keyboard. And I didn't turn it on. Why didn't I not get audio? There we go, down here. Oh, let's just start recording. For some reason, this one's not giving me audio right now. Let's pick another one. Uh, let me pick one of the Kiwis just to show you what they look like, too. So when you go to the Kiwi site, it lets you search by location. So if I say Ohio, for example, I will see the ones that are available in Ohio. I'm going to go down to the one in Westchester down in the Cincinnati area. Cincinnati-Dayton area, I should say. Now, sometimes on the Kiwis, if another person's using that particular one, you'll have, you won't be able to use it at that time. Hey, let's see if Mark is still there. Uh, Mark, I'm not here. Well, that one came right on tune to someone. Hotel Mike Milo, what's your call? So the controls are a little bit different on this, but again, you can zoom in. Uh, and right now, this is a nice zoom to be able to see things, so we can just double click where we want to go. So that just give you an idea of using those and the more you play with them the easier they get to use other questions it was a question for dennis about what's a reasonable distance away i think that's a great question too um it, it depends on a number of things it depends on the band you're on it depends on on the kind of power level that you're running on your system that you want somebody else to listen to like if i'm running if i'm running a kilowatt and a half and want somebody to listen to me. I want them fairly far away from me. And uh, that's why the web SDRs are great for that. You don't have to have somebody at the other end. You do it yourself. One other caution about using the web SDRs, and I use KFS up in the Bay Area. Uh, that's on that, When I'm on the air, I've pretty much got that thing on all the time. And the, the, the problem is that there's a delay. So if you're on phone, on sideband, and you're talking and you're listening to your own voice coming back to you, like a half a second later. If you've never done that before, it can be very disconcerting. And what you'll do is you'll start slowing down <laughs> the way you talk. <laughs> it's kind of funny, but, uh, but that's something to be aware of. That uh, yeah, you, you're you're getting a you're getting basically getting feedback. And if you're not wearing a pair of headphones, you will get feedback, and it'll just start echoing, which is always fun to be talking to somebody on the air and hear that echo. You know you know that they're listening to. To listening to an SDR somewhere so <laughs> and, and actually that's very good practice for when we get another high orbit satellite again because that's how I cut my teeth on Oscar 10 and you, you have to you have to learn to ignore your own voice or you, you keep slowing down or speeding up and listening for you know listening and listening because it's like hello 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 okay 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 yeah so yes there's a definitely an echo I, the people I use uh, are about three miles away from me, and that seems to work most of the time. I'm running low power most of the, mostly here, but I had another gentleman who was less than probably 2,000 2, yards from me, and we were definitely too close, even with my five watts. 
uh, yeah, I think with low power being a few miles away is perfect. And uh, yeah, if you got somebody that's a, like my case, I, I got a neighbor next door that's 300 feet away, 600 feet away. Yeah. yeah, I don't use him to test my signal. He's always calling me to listen for him. And I, you know, it just doesn't work. You know, <laughs> put an attenuator in the receive line or something. Yeah, you know, it's the only way you can get that to work. But yeah, that's a good question about distance. Um, yeah, few few miles out to you know 20 miles 25 miles or maybe even farther depending on the band and the time of day and all of that that's reasonable yeah anthony thanks again that's a great presentation a lot of good material yeah. okay is there anything else in uh, chat there barry